Thomas of the session uh, talking about Entru. Um, he'll be uh, telling us about more efficient methods for generating uh, NTRU trapdoors. And uh, this is Thomas Pornin of the NCC group. Thomas, uh, take it away. The floor is yours. Okay. So, uh, you saw just a few minutes or hours ago the presentation from the other Thomas. And uh, this specific talk was motivated by uh, Falcon, which is an a candidate uh, to the post NIST post quantum competition, and it has an NTRU uh, lattice, and it requires uh, what we call a complete basis and the state of the art for NTRU lattices with a complete basis was from times of NTRU sign, and the generation required a lot of RAM and was unsuitable for small computing systems. So this talk explains how we could make it fit on microcontrollers. So the outline, I will first, okay, I have a few slides about NTRU lattices, but uh, since you were all this morning listening to the other Thomas, you already know everything which is in that. So it will just serve as a way to present the notation I am using. And in particular, I have a, voluntarily uh, implementation view of things. So uh, there are uh, less algebra and uh, more uh, implementation issues here. So I will present some of the tools that are needed, so FFT, NTT, Baba is near its planes, and some algebra still, resistance of polynomial. And then I will present the classic NTRU solver and why it works and why it uses a lot of computing resources. And then I'll show how to use some nifty uh, equation games, which have an algebraic interpretation as field norms. And that allow us to save a lot of space. And we could improve it by a factor of more than 100, which is not negligible. So there are two articles a link here. The first one is dedicated to uh, the NTRU key pair generation, and it was published on uh, Picasso last year, and it's co authored with the other Thomas. So, and the second one is just an imprint, and it's an uh, implementation oriented report on the implementation of Falcon on small microcontrollers with constant time code. So, these are the two relevant sources for what I'm explaining here. So NTRU lattices in this talk are all about polynomials. For a polynomial, which is, we first use the monic polynomial, which is a modulus, which is phi. And then for any polynomial taken modulo phi, we can interpret it as a matrix, a negacirculant matrix, as Thomas said. And it's a, it's a nice map because it preserves addition and multiplication. That is the map of the sum of two polynomials is the sum of the maps of the two polynomials and the same for the products. So what that means is that we can use polynomials and forget everything about matrices. We know that there's a lattice somewhere in there. And for most of the talk, we will ignore the fact that there is a lattice. The NTRU equation is about given two small f, small g polynomials modulo phi with integer coefficients, uh, finding two other polynomials, which are also with integer coefficients and modulo phi, big G, big F, that fulfill this equation, fj minus gf equals to some given integer q. Uh, q is usually small. In Falcon, it's a prime integer. Um, in what I explained, it's not necessarily prime, but in any case, it's given. And we have to notice here, it's multiplication of polynomial with integers as coefficients, not modular integers. They are uh, conceptually unbounded. 
And most of our troubles are because they can become quite large. So solving the MTU equation is needed in order to get this. That is, uh, if we have a solution to the interior equation and fg, big F, big G have small coefficients with some notion of small. And then, and also there is an extra polynomial H, which is in fact G over F modulo phi and modulo Q this time. Then we have two matrices in the matrix interpretations that are basis for the same lattice of dimension 2n. And the matrix on the left is a private key, and the matrix on the right is a public key. That is, the one on the left has uh, all its elements are much smaller than the one on the right. And in the original NTRU for encryption, only the top half was needed for the algorithm to work. So generating two F and G small enough was easy. But for NTRU sign and also Falcon and other algorithms, we need a complete basis that is uh, also to have the big G and big F. And all of the problem is finding a big G and big F. So in the case of Falcon, the degree of phi is 512 or 1024, and is a power of two. In the first version of Falcon, we also used other size, uh, other cyclotomic polynomials, and we removed it because there was no uh, clear advantage to doing so. But there were clear disadvantages, namely that it makes the code a lot more complex, like uh, three times larger. So we uh, simplified things. Q is that value, which is prime, which is one plus a multiple of 2048. And the coefficients of the small polynomials are less than 20. Usually, in fact, they are uh, close to zero with the Gaussian distribution. So in practice, you'll see a lot are between minus five and plus five. And for the big F, big G, they are slightly larger, but they all fit on one byte each. So these are small coefficients. And uh, Z5 is a 2n cyclotomic polynomial. It's irreducible over Q of X. And we don't really use that fact except for the algebraic implementation, uh, algebraic interpretation of things. So here is a toy example. And I'm reducing the degree to eight just so that it fits on slides. And when you reduce the degree, the coefficients of f and g can become a, a bit larger. And though the, that's why we can see things like minus 55, which is definitely larger than 20. But anyway, here is a small coefficient f, a small polynomial f and g. And here, are, here is a solution to the NTRU equation with big f and big g. Not that. Uh, the solution of the interior equation is not usually not unique. I mean, you have many solutions to the interior equation, and even if we restrict to small solutions, there may be several choices. We don't really care which one we get. Everyone is fine enough for our purposes. Um, <clears throat> Thomas, a question? Yeah, yes. Go ahead, Chris. Um, so you have little f, little g, and then big F, big g, which are somewhat larger than their little uh, siblings. Um, you know, usually I think of a, a good basis as uh, all the vectors are roughly the same norm. Um, that's that's not the case here. They're off by a, some factor. <clears throat> Is that okay because you're going to be doing Gram-Schmidt or are you just satisfied with the length of uh, big F and big G? Okay. When doing the key pair generation, there is a, a threshold to meet. And if we find the big F and big G, which are above the threshold. We just scrap the small F and small G and start again. And while the threshold is enough, uh, is some Falcon magic that I do not fully understand. But the other Thomas knows. So he told me this is the threshold and I just trust him. I'm not entirely sure why. Is that okay? Sure. Um, I guess you could, you could say that um, if you wanted to, 
um, you, you might target little f, little g, big F, big G, all being roughly the same size. Um, is it possible to do that, or do you, you have to have some some gap between their sizes? In practice, they are about the same size, but when we go small enough, I mean, usually big F and big G are the coefficients are no more than two or three bits larger than the coefficients of small f, small g. So when there are thousands of bits large, they are uh, in practical sense the same size. Uh, when we are at the end of the algorithm and we have small coefficients, they are about that. And we use Babai's nearest plane, and that's about the best that it can do in that case. Okay, I, great. Yeah, thank you. So uh, another question. So um, you know the coefficients of f and g are they chosen from a discrete Gaussian in in Falcon or uniform in from Falcon, small f and small g are a discrete Gaussian, and it's centered okay. on zero and mm -hmm. it yeah. has a specific uh, distribution. Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. which uh, was the sigma thing that Thomas was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the sigma is larger when we have a small degree like here with degree eight. And we okay. see here that the H, which is modulo Q that time, has coefficients which are larger than F and G. And it's part of the public key, which makes sense. So one of the tools that we need to use is the discrete Fourier transform. And we saw all about it already this morning. The, so it's basically a bijection bet between two representations of the same polynomial. There is a convenient property which must be pointed out here, which is that if your source polynomial is real, that is, uh, it could have complex coefficients, but if all the coefficients are real numbers, then uh, the, uh, the application of f over one of the roots of the phi polynomial is equal to the conjugate of the application over one of other roots of polynomial. That is the FF, the Fourier transform representation of n complex in, uh, numbers is redundant. We can uh, store only half of the, of the numbers and we can still do all the computations we need. And this is convenient because if we start with n real numbers, and we can replace that with n over two complex numbers, each with a real and an imaginary part, and it takes the same size. So we are talking about a transform which is in place in the RAM. For Falcon 1024, that's uh, 1024 uh, floating point value, so eight kilobytes. And since we are targeting microcontrollers with something like uh, 60 kilobytes of RAM, uh, the difference between eight and 16 kilobytes is uh, very significant. So the fast Fourier transform is the way to go to the Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform representation and back in uh, N log N operations. It's, it's well known. And uh, in implementation, we use always the bit reversal indexing because it's minimizes the data movement. So the entity is the same thing, except everything is different because we're uh, computing modulo a small prime p. Small, uh, meaning any prime p will work. In practice, we'll use primes smaller than 32 bits. So we need a prime p such that phi splits over dp so that it has n roots and we can evaluate a, a polynomial with integer coefficient over all these roots and it's done modulo p. And then again, it's um, n log n operations. So for phi to split over dp, we need uh, p to be equal to one modulo two n in the case of our stichotomic polynomial. And there are many small primes which are convenient for that. It's, uh, they're not rare, we've got choice. And uh, of course the entity is n again and it's efficient. And uh, it's uh, compatible with computation uh, over integers. That is, it can be expressed as we do everything modulo p 
and it still works. Even though the roots of phi over ZP have about nothing to do with the roots of phi over complex, complex number. And another tool, which is Baba's near Spain, is another thing that is, uh, from my point of view, a bit of the scary magic, which I do not have to understand because as long as it works. And it uh, works in the following way. We first define the adjoint, which is uh, the polynomial which uh, yields the conjugates were evaluated over the roots of phi. And it had, uh, the, it had the following properties, which had if uh, the source coefficient is as real coefficient, then the adjoint also has real coefficients, and they are easy to compute. That is, um, we just reverse the order of most of them and negate most of them. And that works with real numbers. That also works with integers. That also works with uh, modulo p. That is, if I take a polynomial f with integer coefficients and I take its adjoint, I can do all the computation modulo any small point p and it will still work. So the idea here, the translation of Baba's nearest pain with these tools and to my case with polynomials is that if I have a solution to the NTIU equation and I subtract from big F and big G a multiple of small f and small g respectively, then I still have another solution. And the multiple mean multiplied by a polynomial with integer coefficient. And by Bicenary Spain tells me which, which polynomial I should use. I should compute this peculiar expression, which involves the adjoints and the division. And it will lead a polynomial with real and even rational coefficients. And I have to wound it to the, each coefficient to the nearest integer. And it's not completely guaranteed that one doing it once will yield the smallest uh, solution that I can hope for with Baba's theory Spain. But I can apply it repeatedly. Moreover, this wounding is an approximation. And I am allowed to be uh, more approximate, less precise. So that in practice, uh, since there's a division, I will have to resort to floating point, and we know that floating point has limited precision. So what I'm doing is that I first approximate the f and g with floating point numbers, that is with some degree of precision. Um, uh, there is a scaling, I have to use the scaling coefficient so that the values are representable as floating point numbers because floating point numbers have a limited range. It's two to some exponents and the exponent cannot go beyond 1024, but the, in the computations I will do, the f and g, which I will work over, may go much beyond that range. I do similarly for big F and big G, and then I compute with the floating point value, and there's a division, so I'm using the f of t so that the division can be done on a pair coefficient basis. Then I'm doing a wounding and I get a k tilde which is approximate and with very small integer coefficients. I arrange for them to fit about on 25 bits. And when I do that, one wound will reduce big F and big G by about 25 bits. And I will have to do it repeatedly in order to make them small enough. But it works well, it's like shaving off uh, what goes over the line. So a final tool that I need now, no, that's a question. Okay. Um, the question is, what option do you have for performing multiplication in ZPX over phi if you cannot choose P such as P is equal to one modulo 2N? 
and therefore cannot use NTT. Um, you can do it uh, with a schoolbook way, but then it will be quadratic uh, in the degree. You can uh, also use Karatsuba, and then you'll get, uh, when you multiply two uh, 1024 bit polynomials together in three multiplication of polynomials of all size. So nine, nine multiplication of a quarter size, 27 multiplication of the eighth size, and so on. So it's, um, it's less convenient, uh, not only because it's slower, but also because it will require uh, some extra temporary buffers. So you increase the RAM usage. But usually you don't want, but in what I will explain, you have many small primes that you can choose for, and you have sufficiently many that the question does not arise. So back to our resultant. And the resultant is an algebraic property. In fact, it's got several definitions. One of them involves the Sylvester matrix. And the other one, which I will use here, is resultant of two polynomials A and B is basically the product of application of B over all roots of A with a scaling coefficient. And it's equal to the product of application of A over all roots of B with another scaling coefficient. And there's a lot of theory about it. To the important point here is that if you start with two coefficients with integer coefficients, two polynomials with integer coefficients, the resultant will be an integer. And if you apply the extended Euclidean GCD algorithm, that's sticking on integers, the, and the polynomials are co-prime as polynomials, then you will get not one, but a polynomial of degree zero, which will be equal to the resultant. Uh, an equivalent way to see that, to express that, is that when you do the extended Euclidean GCD with, uh, with your polynomials, but working with rational, you can arrange for the GCD to be one. That is a unitary polynomial. But to do that, you need to perform some divisions. And then the um, Bezu coefficients U and V that you get are polynomials with non-integer coefficients. But multiplying them by the resultant will yield integer. So in a sense, the resultant is uh, characterizes the extension of denominators when using fraction. In the classical method, we are using all of these. So we want to solve the entire U equation. So we first use the extended Euclidean GCD algorithm on polynomials, and you get all these extra polynomials. You do it twice, once to get the resultant of phi with f, and the other, the resultant of g with pi, pi with g. Okay. So when you have this equation, that what that means is that uh, s is almost the inverse of polynomial f modulo phi, almost because the product is not one; it's an integer, but it's the resultant, and idem for g. The s prime and t prime, you can forget them because you won't use them, but s and t will be used. Now that you have ways to quasi inverse small f and small g, you can use again the extended Euclidean GCD algorithm, but this time on integers over the two resultants. And then you get the Bezu, the Bezu coefficients that yield uh, the linear combination, which equals to the GCD resultants. First resultant times u plus second resultant times v yields the GCD delta. If you are lucky, uh, delta divides you. Because if delta is not a divisor of your target Q, then there won't be any solution. You can scrap the F and G and start over. But if there is a solution, and uh, then you can have a solution to the entire equation. It's a solution with, with uh, 
big coefficients. They're very large. So it's not a suitable solution. But then you can apply Baba is in your explain to make big F and big G much smaller. So I've worked out in my toy example what that uh, yields. So we are back to degree eight. It's a toy example, small f. Resultant of phi and f is a relatively large integer. So this yields s, the first coefficient, and we have the product of small f by s is equal to the resultant when taken modulo phi. So you can trust me or you can trust Sage, it works. We do the same for G, another resultant, small t, another result. So now we have our S and T polynomials, we've got the two resultants. So we, it turns out that the two resultants are prime to each other, so that GCD is one. So one will be a divisor of our target Q, whatever the Q we want, but in this case, Q is uh, 12,289. And from that, we can get the big F and the big G. And if you input that in your favorite uh, symbolic calculation software, you can verify that this is a correct solution to the NTIU equation. But of course, it's a solution with big coefficients. So now we ask uh, Baba is near his plane to compute the, uh, the K polynomial. It's a wounding of a polynomial with non-integer coefficients. So here I write only the result of the wounding. And applying the reduction, we get this big F and big G with reasonably small coefficients, which in this case are sufficiently small. Now, this shows in fact where the problem is. We've got uh, coefficients with a large degree and large coefficients. So we, if we try to do that with PyCon 1024, the small s and t will turn out to be about 6,300 bits each coefficient. And there are 1,024 of uh, such coefficients for s and another 1,040. And after applying the Bezier coefficient from the second Euclid extended Euclid and GCD over the resultant, we end up with big F and big G, which will be about 13,000 bits per coefficient. So the total size, just to have that in RAM, is about 3.3 megabytes. And 3.3 megabytes will not fit in a small microcontroller because uh, we want to be able to fit in a embedded system with 64 kilobytes of RAM or less. Thomas? Yes. Yeah, a question. Um, in the calculation you just showed, the you do the resultant of F with phi and the resultant mm -hmm. of G with phi. How are these related to the field norm of F and G? Are they the same thing or? Uh, yes, but in a couple of slides only. Uh, okay. okay so <laughs> You're just, just getting your head. <laughs> okay, uh, they are related. Yes, absolutely. But first, a graphical representation because I find it useful to have a mental picture when thinking about things. Here is a graphical representation of F and G. Uh, horizontally, each is a polynomial, and the height of each box represents the size of the coefficient. So we've got here two degree eight polynomials and the coefficients are small. But when we apply the classic interior solver to get the big F and big G, we get this. So the screen is covered, which means many coefficients, which are big. And then Baba is near planes, will reduce them to a smaller size. And at the end, everything fits in relatively low RAM. But the intermediate values are large. And that's what we want to solve. So what we are going to do is to use a degree halving, which we already saw because uh, it's also something you have in the field norms and in the FFT, in the butterfly and so on. Here is uh, how I thought about it. It's with the hands. I mean, uh, 
thinking about where coefficient go when implementing the computation. The idea is that if you have, uh, if phi is such that all these coefficients, all these non-zero coefficients have an even index, then you can imagine a polynomial A and B with alls, in fact, this one, with all the odd index coefficient to zero, and it's equivalent to not having the holes, that is to computing modulo the half degree polynomial and with all the holes removed in that sense. That is, you can move between the half degree and the same polynomials, but with uh, a zero for each odd index coefficient. So it uh, works with other divisors and two, but here I would present everything about just halving the degree, which is the most efficient situation. And of course, if we start with n a power of two, we can do that repeatedly. So we saw this equation with uh, the other talk from the other Thomas. Uh, if we take a polynomial f, and we can separate the even coefficient and the odd coefficients, which in fact is expressed as using two sub polynomials in the half degree, that is modulo x power n over two plus one, which I call fe as even and fo as odd. And then we can uh, express another polynomial, which I call f prime, which is the same except that the coefficient with an um, odd in index have been negative. And if I multiply f with f prime, the thing simplify out and I get f plus square minus x f plus square. That is, I can get the product to be just the image of a half degree polynomial. Or said equivalently, the product will have all its own, all its odd index coefficients equal to zero. Now this is entirely with the hands. This has an algebraic expression, which is the field norm. To talk about the field norm, you need a field. That is, you would have to be over rationals, Q over X over X to the N plus one, so that Q is a field and X to the N plus one is irreducible. Otherwise you don't get a field. And if you do not have a field, you do not have a field norm. You've got something uh, which is similar, but it's not a real field norm. But the point of using just the computation with the ends is to show that it does not actually require us to work with a field. It works when we work with integers. It also works when we work modulo a small prime p, even if the phi polynomial is not irreducible over the p. And it turns out, and apparently it's a known fact that I did not know that, that uh, if you compute the resultant of phi with f, it's exactly the same value as the resultant of the field norm of f with the half degree phi. And you can do that repeatedly. So this can lead to uh, an efficient subalgorithm to compute resultants. It's not the solution, it's not, uh, it will not yield what we seek, that is a reduction in one side, but it's uh, an important step in uh, finding the actual algorithm. So we have to, uh, here we notice something which is also convenient, which is that uh, Finnorm works well with uh, the entity. That is, uh, it's no longer a field because we're going to do things modulo p. Yes? No question? Okay. Uh, so we're going to do things modulo p, but if uh, we go to entity representation, then the entity representation of n of f uh, is easily obtained by multiplying pairwise uh, the coefficients of the entity representation of f. And so if you want to apply that repeatedly to get down to the smallest degree, which is one, you would just have to multiply all, uh, all elements of the entity representation together. 
and it would just work. So this means that if you want the entity, the and then right turn. Okay. <laughs> So if you want to compute the resultant of phi with the polynomial f with integer coefficient, then you can do that modulo many small primes. And for each small prime, you're going to choose small primes where the entity works well, that is small primes p, such as p equal one modulo to n. So you reduce your source polynomial modulo p, you compute the entity representation, you multiply all the coefficient together and that the resultant modulo that small prime p. And when you have enough of them, you can use the Chinese remainder theorem to rebuild the resultant. So this does not improve things really in our cases, in our case, but it presents important tools. Uh, also, I'm uh, here not talking about how to know that you have used sufficiently many small primes. This will be explained a bit later on. From that fast resultant, uh, the, the important uh, remark, something which uh, from my point of view was important, but maybe it's trivial from uh, the point of view of people who do more math than me, but the important part here is that it's a product. That is to get the field norm, you multiply F by another polynomial, which is easily obtained from F. So here I introduce a few extra notation because we're going to jump between degrees. So I'm just representing, I'm just calling F with an index, which is the norm of the one with double the degree and idem for G. So what I wrote here is exactly what I wrote here, but the same thing. So we know that when we go to the degree N equal to one, that's F1, F1. And we know that applying the field normal, the norm, which is a field norm when we have fields, uh, repeatedly uh, conserves the resultant. So now suppose that we have a solution for the half degree, that is for F and G N, and we have a solution for F N over two, G N over two to the NTRU equation. Then from that solution, we can easily compute a new solution with degree n. And it just works. And it's, uh, it uses the fact that, in fact, the norm is just a product, so they, they just uh, group as it should. Now, with that, we have a recursive algorithm for finding a solution. That is, we go to the half degree, recursively invoke ourselves to get a solution for the half degree, then infer a solution to the larger degree. If we just do that, uh, you won't solve the size problem. You'll still get a solution with big polynomials with very big coefficients. But now it's been split into a number of recursive invocations. So you have occasion to apply the bias near space algorithm which is point two here. This is the recursive solver. You start with Fn, small f and small g. If uh, you are already at degree one, then it's a matter of uh, using the extended GCD on integers and you just apply it and you get a solution which will be in fact about the same size of f and g. Otherwise, you apply the sort of field norm you call yourself recursively on the half degree. From the solution, you infer a solution with big coefficient, and then you apply Baba's nearest plane to reduce that solution to make it about, to make the big F and big G about the same size of small f and small g. Graphically, you start with small f and small g, then you apply the field norm to get to the half degree. When you go to the half degree, the coefficients will be about twice bigger, but there are half as many. So the total size of these half degree f and g has not changed. And you do that, 
again and again. So here, starting with eight, now they have they are polynomial of degree zero and n is equal to one. So these are integers. Using the extended Euclidean GCD algorithm, you get this. So the big F and big G are slightly larger than the small f and small g because they have the multiplication by two. And then you apply Baba's nearest pain to even reduce that. So you end up with big F and big G, which are about the same size of small f and small g, with maybe two extra bits. And then when you go back from the recursion, this time applying, turning that solution at degree one into a solution of degree two will make the f, big F and big G quite larger about three times the size of small f and small g. But Baba is near Spain will be efficient and will reduce that to about the same size as f and g. And then you go up and up, and you end up with a solution. And if you try to do it graphically, you see that uh, you never touch a large part of the slide, which means there is a large part of RAM that you are not using. And this is only with degree eight, but with a larger degree, the savings are significant. That is the 3.3 megabytes have become less than 30 kilobytes. So it's 150 15 times smaller. So now it can fit in the microcontroller. And as a bonus, it's also 100 times faster. So we, we won't mind. It was not the primary optimization, but it's, uh, it's nice nonetheless. So now it can fix on a, it can fit on an ARM Cortex M4, and complete KPR generation will be 170 million cycles for Falcon 2012. On the M4 I was using, it was clocked at 168 MHz, so we're talking about one second. And for the double size Falcon, long term security, it's about three seconds. And now, of course, I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to go faster. And uh, when we're talking implementation, we wanted to have a secure implementation. So this means constant time. And constant time means uh, memory access pattern should not depend on secret value. And in particular, the length, the exact length in bits of any individual coefficient should remain hidden. So there is a strong and important principle here, which is that it's for KPR generation and we are allowed to fail. That is, uh, we may have a small f and small g, which would yield a computable solution, but it's not a problem if we reject a small proportion of valid, uh, valid KPR, because we can just generate a new one. As long as we do not reduce too much the space of possible keys, we are not losing any significant in uh, part of our security. So in practice, and uh, with all restriction, in fact, I'm using one bit of, uh, that is half of the potential keys are unduly rejected, which is not that bad in fact. And since we are allowed to fail, we can use a fixed size buffer with a, a good size. That is, we can measure the average size in bits of the maximum coefficients of all values at all steps of the computation. And then we take six times the standard deviation. So here, for instance, for uh, the resultant buffer, I can say, okay, I can use uh, 6,455 bits and it will almost always be sufficient. And this works because in the end, it's easy to verify whether I got the correct solution of the entire equation or not. So uh, in the course of the computation, I need to represent all my coefficients, all my polynomials and their coefficients with multiple competing representation and I keep jumping from one to another. So I represent polynomials either as limbs in base two to the 31. The extra bit is convenient because I, in portable C, I don't have access to the carry flag. Then I also uh, replay these values with uh, a residue number system in which I reduce the polynomial 
modulo many small primes which are close to 231 but slightly below. And when they are reduced modulo p, I can use the entity representation. So again, a mental picture horizontally uh, is the, uh, are the coefficients of my polynomial f. Each coefficient is represented vertically as either a number of limbs in base 2 to the 31 or uh, the values of the coefficients reduce modulo each small prime. So the Chinese remainder theorem and reducing the value modulo each small prime are the two operations that can make me, help me switch between the two representations. Horizontally, when I am in RNS representation, I have polynomials modulo each small prime, and I can apply the entity and inverse entity to allow multiplications to go faster. So whenever I'm trying to apply the field norms, even though there are not fields, I'm uh, going to RNS and apply the entity because we saw that then it's just a matter of multiplying uh, coefficients uh, pairwise. When I'm multiplying polynomial, polynomial together, I'm again using RNS so that all values are modulo p, but uh, if the degree of the polynomials is high, then I also use entity. When it's small, it's actually a bit faster to just uh, skip the entity and use the uh, normal quadratic algorithm. But the uh, threshold experimentally is around degree 16 or 32, that's the optimal. But it's a matter of measuring, depends on the architecture. When I uh, am in RNS, sometimes I need to care about the fact that the integers will grow. Uh, so maybe I am in RNS, but with not enough uh, moduli. So I need to go back with Chinese remainder theorem to the lean representation and then reduce it again, modulo more small primes. A lot of these operations can be done in place, including Chinese remainder theorem with some pre-computed value. And uh, in fact, the implementation will keep interleaving this. That is at many points, I will have the, the number of value which will be F modulo small primes, but uh, the upper value are still limbs and back. And I'm doing the entity and inverse entity as I go. So there is a lot of uh, buffer management to make it fit under the 30 kilobytes that I have promised. Since I have three competing representations for polynomials, I added a fourth one. <laughs> which is that each coefficient when chosen modulo p is also in Montgomery representation because uh, it's that one is pretty technical. Uh, it's allows for constant time operations, addition and multiplication. And, uh, and these are relatively efficient. They are more efficient than using Barrett reduction in that case. It's just a matter of saving a few clock cycles, but it matters in the end. When using Baba's nearest plane, unfortunately, you have to use floating point and floating point is not necessarily constant time on any given architecture and on the cortex M4, it's not constant time, it's not there. It's actually missing. There's no SPU with the precision we need. So it has to be emulated with integer code. And in practice, using the emulator slows things down, but not that much that is even of a big PC, you just make it will just take two to 2.3 times more times than when using the hardware floating point. And it's guaranteed to be portable and constant time, which is nice. So you can live with floating point here. It's not that bad. Uh, it may be possible to use fixed point and working on that. And uh, there are some, uh, there is some extra trickiness because you do not want to leave the size of F and G. And in fixed point, you don't have a convenient uh, exponent field just to store the exponent information. Final slide because I'm uh, overrunning my time. In the recursive algorithm, uh, whenever I go up, I have computed partial F and G. And I need to remember them for when I'm 
coming back from the from the recursion. So I have to store them somewhere. What if I don't store them? Well, it works. Uh, I have to recompute them when the recursion comes back, but it's not that expensive comparatively. Uh, I've been it has been measured. It makes the computation about 15% slower, but it saves RAM. So that's how I get under 30 kilobytes. Otherwise, I would be around uh, 38 kilobytes on Falcon 1024. And another tweak is that uh, in the case of Falcon, Q is prime. And when Q is prime, we need the two resultants to be basically co prime, or to be both multiple of Q, uh, to have a, which is rare because Q is prime. So resultants are basically random. So it's rare that they will have Q as GCD. So we can restrict ourselves to the case where they are co prime. And the sub K that we can filter out quite early is when they are both even. If both resultants are even, then the GCD cannot be one and it cannot work. And it turns out that if you try to compute the resultant of phi with F modulo two, it can mean on very easily, you just add all coefficients modulo two and it yields the correct value. So you can, whenever you have generated small f and small g and want to see whether the two resultants uh, at the deepest level of the recursion will both be even, you just take the parity of the sums and if they are both even, then you can reject f and g immediately. This saves, uh, in fact, this occurs about uh, not half of the time, one third of the time. So you, you gain 30% of the speed like that. So that's it, it's, uh, it's the description of the algorithm and uh, with the hand waving, that is, uh, is the way I think about it. It's all about implementing things with polynomials using some uh, magical tools that I don't fully understand. Any question? Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> are, are, are there any questions? We have a minute or so. We can uh, take any brief questions. Oh, okay. I saw that there were questions and you answered all of them, so thank you. <laughs> Check that I answer them correctly. You can endorse uh, or disagree. Uh, could you pass and what the Cal computer will reduce the coefficient of big F and big G to the side reduction? Yeah. I mean, the, uh, my intuition of Baba's near explain is that it's a kind of projection. So you're projecting the big F and big G over the small F and small G with some notion of. Uh, multidimensional projection and it reduces the projection to uh, the size of the small f and 4g which are that on which you are projecting so that's how i think about it and i'm pretty sure this is not a right way to think about it but in practice it works that way okay are there any other uh, questions All right, we should, someone should play the the, um, the left track or the applause track, please. So I think people should unmute when clapping. That's the problem.